say okay. Thank you, Zach. Yes, this class is based on the book Baptism in the Early Church, a copy of which is on the uh, table by the entrance. This morning we're going to ask the question, what was distinctive about Christian baptism? Is there something unique or distinctive about Christian baptism? Or was it simply borrowed from its environment? This is a historical, not a theological question. Uh, God can take something already known and use it for his purposes. And doing so does not affect the validity of the act. But in fact, we will see that historically speaking, there are some distinctive features of Christian baptism. I want us to look first of all at the Greco-Roman background. It is very common throughout the world to use water for religious purification. And water was commonly and widely used in the Greek and Roman worlds for ceremonial purification as well as for hygiene. Uh, The method of applying the water uh, could vary. Herodotus, the Greek historian of the 5th century BC, describes a dipping. In explaining that Egyptians considered pigs unclean, Herodotus says that if an Egyptian touched a pig, he went to the river and dipped himself in his clothes. But the purification could also be by sprinkling. An inscription from a temple at Lindos in Rhodes from the second century of the Christian era mentions a sprinkling. You are purified on the same day by a lustral sprinkling and anointing with oil. Or the purification could be by a pouring. Another inscription from Sunion in Greece dated 2nd or 3rd century, uh, mentions a a pouring. This is uh, a sanctuary uh, at Sunion. You may go in the same day after washing with water poured over your head. One aspect of the Greco-Roman background of Christianity that has attracted a lot of scholarly attention is the practices in the mystery uh, religions. Here too the application of water was a preliminary purification. Apuleius describes in some detail his initiation into the mysteries of the Egyptian goddess Isis at Sincrea, the port of Corinth. He was writing in the second century uh, uh, AD. He says at the time that the priest had appointed as most suitable, surrounded by a crowd of devotees, I was led to the baths. There, after delivering me to the usual bath, Mithra, who was the high priest of the cult of Isis at Corinth, invoked the pardon of the gods, and sprinkling water over me, he cleansed me uh, most purely. Notice there was both a bath and a sprinkling. And these acts were not the initiation. These preliminary purifications were public. But the initiation itself was secret. And Apuleius proceeds to describe it in general terms that initiates would recognize, but outsiders like ourselves can only speculate as to what was actually done. It is important to note that there is no example of a baptism as the initiatory act itself in Greco-Roman paganism. The application of water was a preliminary ceremonial purification and the actual initiation uh, was something different and followed that. Part of the Greco-Roman background to Christian usage is the way words were used. Uh, The Greek words from which our English word baptize derives 
were not religious words in classical Greek. Babto, which means a dip, was uh, commonly used. In the Greek playwright Euripides, who wrote in the 5th century BC, we have the line, Old servant, take a vessel, dip in seawater, and bring here. A secondary meaning of babto, which came then to predominate in usage, was for dyeing a garment or something, to dye, D-Y-E, not D-I-E. In Sophocles, another uh, Greek uh, playwright of uh, the same period, says, I dyed his garment. Baptizo, which means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse, is the intensive form of babto, and it tended to replace babto in Hellenistic Greek. There are two, re two reasons for this. Strengthened forms of words often replaced weaker forms in the development of a language, and that's still true in our usage. The other factor here is the use of babto for dying. And that required another word for other occasions of dipping. The two most common uses of babto in secular Greek were for the sinking of a ship in a shipwreck and for the drowning of a person. As an example of the usage in a shipwreck, Polybius, who was writing in the second century before Christ, says they rammed the vessels and sank, baptizo, uh, many of them. As uh, an illustration of the use for drowning, although in this case it doesn't actually happen, uh, Strabo's geography. Uh, Strabo's life uh, spanned the end of the first century BC and the beginning of the first century uh, AD. In describing the Dead Sea, he says the one who walks into it uh, drowns but is raised afloat because of the nature of the water. And that's still true for the heavy salt content of the uh, Dead Sea that a person can float uh, on it. But uh, Strabo's word here for one's going down into the water, going under the water, is the word uh, bab. Baptizo. Now, baptizo also had a number of metaphorical uses in the sense of being overwhelmed. Just as in immersion you are overwhelmed with water, so you could be overwhelmed with other things. Uh, Diodorus of Sicily, who wrote in the first century BC, uh, said that good rulers do not overwhelm swamp baptizo, private citizens by, tax, by taxes. Uh, that's a sentiment with which uh, modern readers can certainly identify. <laughs> Another metaphorical use was for drunkenness. In Plato's uh, Symposium, uh, Plato was writing in the 4th century, early 4th century BC, he quotes one of the participants in the a dialogue as saying, I am myself one of those who yesterday was drunk. Some of the English translations say soused. Uh, it's the word baptized. They were overwhelmed with the influence of alcohol. It is sometimes contended that, although this was the classical meaning of baptizo, that among the Jews, the word had come to have a different or specialized meaning. But that is a conjecture without foundation in the sources. I'll cite one uh, quotation from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Second Kings uh, chapter 5, verse, verses 10 and 14. 
in the account of uh, Naaman uh, the Syrian. The verb wash is used in the command given to him to wash in the Jordan in verse 10. And then in the account of how he did it in verse 14, it says that Naaman immersed or dipped, baptizo, uh, himself. Josephus, the Jewish historian writing at the end of the first Christian century, follows classical usage in using uh, this verb for the sinking of a ship in uh, the Jewish war. He refers to a pilot who deliberately sinks a ship. And uh, Josephus also uses it for drowning a person. Again, from the Jewish war. He says the boy, that's Aristobulus, was sent by night to Jericho. And there, according to King Herod's command, being plunged or drowned in a swimming bath, he died. Well, both the sinking of a ship and drowning of a person are rather thorough submersions. But uh, this was the common usage of uh, baptizo and illustrates its meaning in the New Testament and in uh, early Christian uh, literature. Well, turning from the Greco-Roman background, let's look now at Jewish uh, religious washings. Water was used in ceremonial cleansing among uh, the Jews, just as they, it was in the Greco-Roman world. There are a number of passages in the Old Testament, but I select some verses from Leviticus 14, which describes some of the purification rites. And I select this passage because the verses are particularly instructive for the distinction that Hebrew and the Greek translation observed between dip, sprinkle, and pour. In uh, Leviticus uh, 14, uh, beginning at verse 6, the priest shall take the living bird from the cedar wood and the crimson yarn and the hyssop and dip them, this is babto, dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. He shall sprinkle a different verb now, yet seven times upon the one who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean. The one who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself, wash himself in water, and he shall be clean. In verses 15 and 16 show that wash was understood to mean an immersion or a dipping. Uh, the priest shall take some of the oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. Uh, the Jews made a clear distinction between these three different actions, dipping, uh, sprinkling, and pouring. And different words in both the Hebrew and the Greek translation are used for uh, these different actions. I want now to say a few words about the rabbinic interpretation of the law of Moses. The rabbinic interpretation showed the application of the purity rites as they were being observed in the early Christian centuries. The Mishnah represents the codification of Jewish law in the early Christian period. The Mishnah was compiled about the year 200, but it includes uh, earlier uh, material. And according to the uh, Mishnah's tractate on immersion pools, the Hebrew word is mikvayot, and uh, the translation is uh, immersion pools. And in uh, the Mishnah, mikvayot 2.2, 2, 
immersion pools are to have a depth to permit a grown person to cover the body in it. And a passage later in that tractate says that for a valid immersion, water has to touch all parts of the body. And we're, far, we're fortunate now in having a number of archaeological finds that illustrate these literary texts and that carry the practice back to the first century and so confirm that the Mishnah is giving a literary description of a practice that was much earlier. Hundreds of mikvahot, immersion pools, have been found in Israel and indeed over 150 dated to the first century in Jerusalem alone. Many of these adjoined the Temple Mount and were used for the daily purification of priests and worshipers at the Temple. The presence of this large number of immersion pools around the Temple uh, shows how uninformed was the old contention that 3,000 converts in Acts 2 could not have been immersed without contaminating the city's water supply. Well, we should have known that that was wrong anyway because of the daily purifications the priests had to perform and the purifications that worshippers had to do. There had to be provision for that. Now archaeology has found uh, the uh, proof of that, these actual immersion pools that were uh, available uh, there. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls pre uh, preserve the Old Testament distinctions in terminology uh, for dipping, sprinkling, and pouring. And uh, one passage I'll share with you from the Damascus document, 2nd century uh, BC, in describing uh, purifications as observed by the, what is probably the Essenes. No man shall bathe in dirty water or in an amount too shallow to cover a man. He shall not purify himself with water contained in a vessel. And as for the water of every rock pool too shallow to cover a, uh, a man, if an unclean man touches it, he renders its water as unclean as water contained uh, in a vessel. It's usually thought that the Dead Sea Scrolls were produced primarily by the uh, community that occupied the site of Qumran. And at Qumran, there are found a number of pools, some of which were cisterns for storing water, but some of which seem to have been definitely used for the daily purifications of the uh, sectarian community uh, that was centered at uh, Qumran. There are ten uh, stepped pools, that is pools with steps leading down into them. And these are probably mikvaoth. The unstepped pools are likely the cisterns uh, for uh, water uh, storage. Now I'd like to say a little bit about proselyte uh, baptism because scholars have often considered what relationship it might have had to Christian baptism. Proselyte baptism was the immersion of Gentiles who converted to Christianity, uh, converted to Judaism as part of their initiation into the Jewish uh, community. Uh, there is a question of date for the origin of proselyte baptism. The earliest possible reference to the practice is the late first century, which would put it too late to be part of the background of early Christian practice. And all earlier accounts of conversion to Judaism make no mention of it. The earliest account of the developed conversion ceremony in rabbinic literature goes back to the second century uh, of the Christian era. And that ceremony required circumcision of males, immersion of men and women, 
and an offering at uh, the uh, temple. Proselyte baptism likely originated in this general Jewish practice of washings for purification. The cleansing rite was seen as a symbol of new life and thus later in the history of Judaism became an initiatory uh, act. Uh, proselyte baptism has some important differences from John's baptism and from uh, Christian uh, baptism. As in uh, other Jewish washings, proselyte baptism was self-administered. You dipped yourself in the water. And so it required uh, witnesses to confirm uh, that you had gone through uh, this act. Uh, secondly, proselyte baptism cleansed from pagan impurity but was not for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, third, it was not the central act of initiation. Circumcision was, uh, not the baptism. And again, proselyte baptism was for Gentiles only, for converts from the pagan world to Judaism. And then there is a special provision here that should be noted. Minors in a family who received baptism and circumcision when the family converted could, when they came of age, renounce the act without being con considered apostates. Later generations could not do this. And this special feature of uh, proselyte baptism as it applied to young children and a family that converted I think makes very problematic the argument from proselyte baptism to infant baptism uh, among Christians. It did not have the same significance for Jews that baptism would have had for Christians. Well, let's come now to look at John the Baptizer. First, we'll examine the New Testament texts about his baptism. Uh, Mark 1, verses 4 and 5. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. The account in Matthew is quite similar, Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Luke's account of John's baptismal practice is the briefest of the three. Uh, Luke was fuller than the others on the preaching of John, but he is briefer in his description of John's baptizing. Uh, Luke 3 verse 3, John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Well notice these characteristics of John's baptism. It was a repentance baptism. It was accompanied by confession of sins. It was for the forgiveness of sins, and it was looking toward the kingdom of God. It so happens that we have an independent account of the activities of John uh, from a, a non-Christian. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, in his uh, uh, antiquities, gives an account that in many respects coincides with the gospel text. But there is an important part of that description that differs. Josephus says, John, called the Baptist, was a good man and exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, practice justice toward one another and piety toward God, and so to participate in baptism. In his view, this was a necessary preliminary uh, 
if baptism was to be acceptable to God. They must not use it to gain pardon for whatever sins they committed, but for the purity of the body, implying that the soul was already thoroughly cleansed by right behavior. Well, you notice that this ascribes a different purpose to the baptism from that the gospel texts uh, give. And some scholars have argued that Josephus is a more reliable uh, witness to what the meaning of John's baptism was than the gospels are. However, there are some good reasons to prefer the New Testament account. For one thing, the New Testament records are earlier by two or three decades from when Josephus wrote. And normally historians would prefer the testimony of earlier uh, witnesses to later ones. A second factor here is that the Christian texts represent a movement in continuity with John. Some have countered that the Gospels are reading Christian practice back into him. But uh, it is more likely that since the Christian movement was in continuity with John's movement, John's preaching and practice, that they are in a better position accurately to describe what John was doing. And uh, certainly their testimony is to be preferred to the testimony of an outsider. uh, Josephus had no connection uh, with John's movement. And a third factor is to be brought into consideration here. Josephus may have been describing John's baptism according to what he knew of other Jewish practices, especially the Essenes, for he had been associated with them for a period early in his life. Or Josephus might have been trying to make John's preaching more acceptable uh, to his uh, Gentile uh, readers. And we note that Josephus seems to know the alternative interpretation of forgiveness uh, which he rejects uh, because he makes a point of saying that uh, John's baptism or those who received it were not to use it for obtaining pardon. And so he seems really to know and to be making an argument against the interpretation of John's baptism that we have in the New Testament text. Well, to summarize on John the Baptist, let's point out his comparison to Jewish washings. There are some similarities here. The Jewish washings and John's practice were by immersion. Uh, Both involved the idea of cleansing and both applied to Jews. As to differences, however, John's baptism was an administered baptism, not a self baptism. Hence his name, the baptizer. That distinguished him from others. If he had been doing what everybody else was doing, administering a baptism to people, this designation of him would not be descriptive. But the very designation of him as the Baptist, the one who baptizes, is an indication that he was doing something different. And uh, this identified him. His was an administered immersion rather than a self-immersion. Moreover, John's baptism was a one-time act. In this regard, it was like the later proselyte baptism. But unlike it, it is given to uh, Jews. But it is a one-time act in contrast to the frequent purificatory washings among uh, the Jews as among pagans. John's baptism brought eschatological rather than ceremonial cleansing. It was a purifying of the people in preparation for the kingdom of God. 
John's baptism required repentance. Jewish washings did not. And it brought forgiveness of sins. Jewish washings were for ceremonial purity, not for forgiveness of sins. And so that brings us then to the relationship of John's baptism to uh, Christian uh, baptism. It has some definite similarities to Christian practice. It was an administered immersion. It was a one-time act. It required repentance. And it was for the forgiveness of sins. All of those features are characteristic of Christian baptism. But there were some differences. In John's practice, the baptism was accompanied by a confession of sins rather than a confession of faith in Jesus. In Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias says to Saul of Tarsus, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The baptism is accompanied by a confession of faith, a calling on the name of the Lord. And that is a distinctive feature of Christian baptism, but it is not part of John's baptism. John taught people to believe in the one to come in contrast to believing in one who has come. In Acts chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 we have an account of uh, Paul's encounter with some disciples of John in Ephesus. And this account brings out two of the differences between John's baptism and Christian baptism. Paul said, verse 4, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Verse 5, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and uh, prophesied. Christian baptism is connected with the name of Jesus. It is associated with faith in Jesus. The phrase, in the name of Jesus, describes the meaning of the act. It is associated with a confession of faith in Jesus. That made it different from John's practice. Also, John's baptism did not bring the Holy Spirit. That is the most prominent part of this account in Acts 19, verses 2 through 4. Christian baptism is associated with the activity of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism... Uh, was not. Well, the closest parallel we have to Christian baptism is John's baptism. But there were distinctive features in the Christian practice. And to these we will turn uh, tomorrow as we look at uh, early Christian texts uh, from the 2nd to the 4th century in describing uh, Christian uh, practice. We have a few minutes uh, Uh, Here, if you would like to make some comments of your own or or ask a question. Yes, sir. You just uh, mentioned the connection of Christian baptism with the Holy Spirit. And uh, then you read the uh, verse where the laying on of hands. How is that connected? How is baptism connected to the Holy Spirit? Uh, in the light of the, uh, the further act of... of Alright, for e- uh, purposes of economy in the presentation, I confine myself to the Acts 19 passage. But other passages suggest the activity of the Spirit in uh, baptism itself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verse uh, 13 uh, is a prominent one. Uh, Titus 3, verse 5, the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is active in the baptism itself in bringing about the spiritual 
uh, renewal uh, of a person. Uh, you started out talking about the metaphorical angles of, of baptism in the, in the Greco-Roman world. How much of that, uh, we've, we've been guilty of so focusing on the process that it's, it's become the ritual. How much of that was the consciousness in the New Testament church that they were immersing themselves into the name of Christ or immersing themselves into a lifestyle of Christ as opposed to focusing on the, on the, the act itself? Well, one in interpretation of... Um, some of these New Testament passages is that they're not talking about literal baptism but being immersed into the life of uh, Jesus but uh, we have a number of texts that refer to water uh, being involved there and the uniform Christian uh, interpretation in the early centuries were that it's in the water rite that you are brought into the possession of uh, Jesus Uh, The New Testament does have a metaphorical use of baptism where Jesus himself speaks of his death as a baptism. He's to be overwhelmed uh, in death and sufferings. And those metaphorical uses are sometimes uh, used to indicate that uh, baptism did not have to mean immersion, but it seems to me that all of them are derived from the literal act. Uh, Jesus wasn't uh, just sprinkled on in sufferings uh, or just a few sufferings poured over him. Uh, You know, he was actually immersed in suffering uh, in his death. And so the metaphorical usage is derived from the literal. Yes, sir. We'll be talking about that more tomorrow. John 3, 5 was the most quoted baptismal text in the early church. Everyone understood it to refer to water baptism. And I've often made the observation that it's a quite modern development in interpretation to dehydrate the new birth. Uh, Nobody in the early centuries ever had that idea. Yes, ma'am. All right, she's asking about the meaning of Acts 2, verse 38. Uh, The baptism there, again, is associated with the name of Jesus Christ. That's what makes it Christian baptism, not John's baptism, not Jewish uh, purifications or, or anything else. And it is for the remission of sins, as John's baptism was. And the promise associated with that is that one receives the Holy Spirit. This again is another connection of the Holy Spirit uh, with uh, Christian uh, baptism. In our third presentation, I'll show you some pictures of early Christian baptistries. And it is quite common for these to be in the shape of a, a cross, which would bring out the connection of baptism with the death of Jesus and early Christian authors were quite explicit that it's not the water as water uh, that brings forgiveness of sins. It's the act of God and the Holy Spirit in that act and uh, on the basis of uh, the atoning death of Jesus and his blood that was shed there. Yes. Uh, no, uh, baptism is never associated with being baptized into the name of somebody else. Now the phrase, in the name of or into the name of, was often used. In, uh, in Hebrew, the phrase refers to something you do in respect to something else, or with reference to something, or even in worship to something else. And into the name of is used in Greek literature for into the possession 
of. And so these other uses illustrate the meaning of the phrase. Uh, but uh, it's only in regard to the Christian act that that phrase is put with baptism. All right, our time is uh, up. Uh, we'll have to be adjourned. We're told strictly to let you out. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, please leave a like on the video and be sure to leave a comment underneath telling us what you thought about the video. And please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right, I hope everyone has a great day.